that Hashem loves you. Most people are 100% sure that Hashem loves them. Everyone thinks they have a special connection with God. Like BFFs. Everyone's a best friend with God. They talk to Him. Listen to Him not so much, but they talk to Him. So Rabbi Akiva is telling you a few things here. We'll translate all of it in a moment. Very, very long Mishnah. Includes a couple of verses from the Torah for some sources. But we'll break it down in Bezat Hashem. Try to connect all of it. Rabbi Akiva, we learned about last week, the greatest of all sages, the number one Baal Tshuva of all time. He continues. He says... Beloved is man, for he was created in God's image. And it is indicative of greater love that it was made known to him that he was created in God's image. So first and foremost, Rabbi Akiva says, the fact that you're here already shows that God loves you. The fact that you're still here shows that God loves you because God created you in his image. Now, we have 13 principles of faith in Judaism. Every single Jew needs to know these 13 principles of faith. And anyone that wants to convert and they show up to the Bedin, they can ask you, do you know the 13 principles of faith? And they say, yes, they can ask you what they are. If you don't know them, you can't pass. Like if someone shows up to the, to the Bedin and they tell them, okay, what's the 13 principles of faith? And they say, oh, yeah, uh, J.C. Penney was here 2,000 years ago. And say, okay, thank you very much for coming. Go try another religion. It's not part of our uh, religion, this J.C. Penny. Say, uh, okay, uh, what's number two? Let's say they give him a pass on the first one just to see how bad he really gets. Oh, Hashem will forgive everything. Okay. That's also not part of our 13 principles of faith. So there's 13 principles of faith that every Jew needs to have. These are 13 things that every Jew must believe in order to be considered Jewish. But believe, not just in, you know, in their heart, believe in actual action. One of them is that God does not have an image or a likeness of an image. He has no body. He has no head. He has no face. There's no image. You can't visualize what God looks like. Which is actually one of the biggest problems that Christianity has. They visualize God as a human being. A lowly human being that everything that comes out of his body is smelly, they visualize God like this. This is as retarded as it could get. So, God is not human. Even Bil'am, the wicked, knew this. He said in last week's parasha, what do you think, God's human, he changes his mind? He's not. This is actually one of our 13 principles of faith, that not only is he not human, but he doesn't have any likeness to us. And God himself says to the prophet, Your thoughts are not like my thoughts. I don't think like you. Whatever you think about, it's very, very far away from my thoughts. The solution that you thought was a solution, nine out of ten times is not going to be the solution. Why? Because Hashem's salvation is much greater than you can imagine. There was one time, a mother, old woman, wanted to salvation for our son our son was broke and his tax collector came to his house he said listen if you don't show up with the money by the end of the month we're gonna send you to jail so the mother said what am I gonna do what is my son my son is a winemaker that's it that's all he does he's gonna make money selling wine she says son sell your wine he says Ima I don't have any more. I don't have any more wine. She goes, okay, so go buy more. He goes, I don't have any money either. She goes, so how are you going to pay the taxes? She goes, I don't know. So what does Ima do? She opens the little book. She starts praying to Hashem. 
But at some point, she decided to give Hashem suggestions. So the first suggestion is like, you know what, Hashem, I have an idea for you. Make my son into a lawyer. Lawyers make a lot of money. Even in those days, they were making money. So a week passes by. The son, still a winemaker. You didn't become a lawyer? No. Okay. Ima goes back to Hashem and says, okay, Hashem, maybe a lawyer is a little too much. I understand. Fine. Make my son into a doctor. Doctors make good money. Even the beginning doctors, they make good money. A week passes by. Son, you're still a winemaker? Not a doctor yet. Third week, okay, Hashem, better idea, best idea ever. Make him into a successful businessman. The week passes by. He's still trying to figure out how he's going to pay the taxes. And he has no wine. And he's not a businessman. A day before the tax collector comes, somebody comes to his door and knocks on the door. Yes, hi, I heard you're a winemaker. I'm from out of town. I want one cup of your best wine. He's like, yes, I would love to give it to you, but I don't have. He goes, okay, listen, I know you Jews. I know, I know, you guys want more money. I understand. You guys are businessmen, all of you. Fine. What's your normal price? $50? No problem. I'll give you $150. He goes, no, 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 I don't have. I would give you for 50. 50 is already great. I don't have. He goes, okay, fine. 500. He says, listen, I don't have. I don't have. It's not, it's not 500. Baruch Hashem, it's great. Thank you. I don't have. He goes, fine. I'll give you 1,500 for one cup. What is he going to do? He says, okay, one second. One second. I'll be right back. He goes to the basement. He looks at his barrel. He says, I have nothing. What do I have? A bottom of the barrel. There's a few little fruits in the bottom. What does he have? Nothing. He goes, listen, what do I have? Put some water on it. Put with the fruit. Mix it up a little bit. Give it to the guy. See what happens. What do I have to lose? 1,500 bucks. He goes to the guy. He's scared to death because this guy looks chashuv. Who carries $1,500 these days? He gives him the cup. And he's like closing his eyes just to see maybe the guy's going to hit him. The guy drinks the wine, and he gives him one of these slaps on the back. He's like, see, I knew you could make it. Why, why are you hiding this thing from me? Only 1500 You should have charged more. This is the best wine ever. Wow. The guy is celebrating like he just gave him the man from Shemaim that we got in the desert. He goes, listen, I'm a very, very important mayor in a different city, and I'm having a party in three months. I want... 100 barrels of this wine exactly and I'll pay exactly the same price that I paid now. The kid, winemaker, is now a multimillionaire. He gave him half the money up front. So the ima, the mom, she looks at Hashem, she goes, you know what Hashem? I didn't think of that one. You got me on that one. I didn't think of that one. She thought she was helping Hashem. So sometimes we think we need to help Hashem. Machshevotai, lo machshevotichem. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. Whatever you think is salvation is going to come, it's not it. Why? If it's salvation from Hashem, you can't think of it. If you can think of it, it's not from Hashem. So now, we have Rabbi Akiva, Telling us that Hashem loves you, just the fact that you're here, it's already good news. It's already good news. But even more so, the fact that you were created in His image makes you special. But since Hashem doesn't have an image, what does it mean? So Chazal gives a couple of explanations. One of them is that we have free choice. Now, the free choice that we have is not free choice like we think. Most people think that you can just do whatever you want, and that's free choice. That's not what we have. You can do whatever you want. No questions asked. But it's not exactly like that. Free choice that we think we have is that you can do whatever you want, and there's no consequences. So, for example, you go to work, you get paid. You don't go to work, you don't get paid. That's the free choice we think we have. The free choice we actually have is the free choice according to the Torah. And according to the Torah, 
That free choice means if we go to work, we get paid. If we don't go to work, they send people to our house to beat us up. There's reward and punishment. If we go to work, we work for Hashem, we get rewarded. We don't work for Hashem, we get punished. That's the free choice we have. But that's, in essence, the closest we can get to the image of God. The closest we can get to. Now he says even further, he says this, it's aside from the fact that he shows you his love by creating you, by you being here, by you not being destroyed for all the sins we've already made. He shows you even more love to you by making you know, letting you know that he created you in his image. Now the Gemara says that if you want to give somebody a present, according to Gemara Masechet Shabbat, you have to let them know in advance. To give somebody a present, you have to let them know in advance. Why? We learn it from God. When God wanted to give us the gift of Shabbat, He says, I have a big treasure in my treasure chest, and the name of it is Shabbat. Go tell the people that I'm about to give it to them. So we see that Hashem notified Moshe Rabbeinu to notify the people that He has a big present for them. So it's a very good thing to do if you want to give somebody a present. Let them know there's a present on the way. So here... Rabbi Akiva says the first thing that you have here is that Hashem is telling you that He loves you by you being here first place, in the first place, but even more so by letting you know where you stand. Now a lot of people have different psychological issues. Some people think that they're worthless. Some people think they're priceless. Some people don't want to leave the house because they think that everyone hates them and they're not good enough. And some people think that only roses come out of their body. Mehmet, they think that everything that they say is kadosh, everything they do is right, wrong, and them have nothing in common. It's a lot of people like this. Sometimes it has to do with money. Usually if you have a lot of money, it tends to make people think that their IQ is higher. But believe it or not, I met a lot of millionaires in my life. Many of them are stupid as far as like IQ is concerned, but very, very smart as far as life. Not all of them are uh, Steve Jobs IQ or Albert Einstein. Many people that are very, very wealthy, they don't have, they have standard IQ. Standard, normal, regular person. They don't have like a, some genius IQ. But for some reason or another, people that go from nothing to something feel like their IQ also went up. That's not true. It doesn't go up. It stays the same. So, Rabbi Akiva is saying, listen, the fact that Hashem created you already shows you good. Already shows you that He loves you. Already shows you that He cares about you. The fact that He's telling you where you stand shows you even more. Why? If you just came into the world and you didn't really know what, what to do. You're like one of these atheists. To be an atheist is the worst belief in the world. And the reason why is because you have no purpose. There's no point to life. If you are an atheist, dying or living is the same. Nothing changes. Now for all of those people, it's like, no, what do you mean? Why do I have to believe in God in order for my life to mean anything? Because in order for it to mean something, it has to outlive you. It has to outlast you. It has to be bigger than you. It has to be beyond this life. Now, how many of you have an iPhone? Or have ever had an iPhone? You've had an iPhone before. Now, the last time you checked your phone, which was probably five minutes before you walked in here, did you say, ah, thanks, Steve Jobs? You didn't, right? Did you ever say, ah, Steve Jobs, thank you? No, nobody cares. He died. It's over. He's gone. By the way, he was an atheist. It's gone. Nobody cares. He was a business owner that had a bunch of smart people that had a few ideas. Here you go, you have an iPhone. The end. What you created as far as material is meaningless. Especially beyond your life. It's obsolete. You buy a car, 
Five minutes after you leave the parking lot, it already dropped by 30%. Do you think the guy that put the car together thought about this? No, he said, listen, I'm doing it because I need to make money. Not because the car is the purpose of my life. So for all those people that think that their business, their money, their houses, their, their buildings, that's the purpose of their life, I'm sad to inform you that's a very, very sad achievement because it's not going to outlive you. No one cares. No one cares. As soon as they buy the house, they're not saying, oh, thank the guy that built the house. They don't even know the guy's name. The only reason why they, some people have the name on the building is because the only way to get the donation is if you put the name on the building. But no college student ever asks, oh, do you know who uh, so-and-so was that's on his building? No one cares. No one says, oh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, Steve Jobs' anniversary. That's why it's on the building. Nobody celebrates Steve Jobs' anniversary or anybody that dies' anniversary. No one cares. They just want to go into the building, so they go to the course, and they get past the class, so they get a degree, so they get a job, and maybe become Steve Jobs. They don't care that Steve Jobs found the building. So if material is your purpose, you're living a purposeless life. If your spouse is your purpose, then that means that most people in the world don't have a purpose. Because there are many people that can't find a, sp uh, can't find a spouse. Guys can't find girls, girls can't find guys. Somehow guys find guys and girls find girls, but girls finding each other, they can't. Shem Achem, it's like everything is opposite. We have many people coming to us asking us for help finding a zivug, finding somebody for them. And we'd love to do anything we can to help. What's the problem? The guys that want to get married are usually very young. 20, 22, 25, good heads on their shoulders. Either just did tshuva or a frum from birth. Whatever, just guys that are serious about, let's, let's get started. I want to start a family. I, want to, I don't want to continue sinning. They know that every day, every day they live as a single person, they're closer and closer to sin. Either wasting seed by themselves or having a girlfriend they're not to have. He says, listen, i got to get married. Hashem created a guy with certain inclinations. He can't control it forever. He can't. So they want to get married. Problem is that many of the women, they don't want to get married. When they want to get married? When they're 37, 38, 42, 45, 50. So that's the problem that I'm constantly having is that the girls are in their 30s and 40s. The guys are in their early 20s. You can't make a match. So once you finally get a match, it's like a mitziah. It's like, wow, it's almost a miracle. But it's not a business that I want to be in. And the reason why is because it's even more difficult than this. I tried making a match. Finally, you found a, I found a couple. I finally found a couple. It was like, mamash. I mean, I, thousands of people contact me every day. So, for different reasons. Once in a while, it's for Zivug. So, finally, I found a couple. They're both located in California. Already a miracle of its own. They're both located within, like, you know, driving distance of each other. Miracle number two, Yam Suf. They're both around the same age. I said, this is the man coming from Shemaim. They look at each other's picture. They're attracted to each other. This is this is Moshe Rabbeinu might as well be here. I'm thinking this is the greatest thing that ever happened. They talk on the phone, they get along. I start dancing. I, I tell my wife, I'm like, honey, we finally made a match. They go on a couple of dates. What happens? The girl, the girl calls me, starts complaining to me. What happened? Oh, I didn't know this and I didn't know this. I'm like, yeah, but he told you. Yeah, but I didn't know that way. I didn't know this. Nonsense stuff. I'm like, okay, well, if you don't want it, then it's fine. We'll find another match. You know, I'm already about to cry. I thought I had some miracles. They continue. And then she calls me back, maybe like a month and a half later. They're dating for a little while. A month and a half later, she sends me an email that she's very upset with me. <laughs> like what I do. It's free, by the way. I don't charge. It's free. All this is for free. Like I have extra time in my hands. All this is free. She sends me an email and she's very upset with me because her psychiatrist told her that I shouldn't have made her go out with this guy because he's just not a good match for her. Why? Only Hashem knows. 
but he's not a good match for her, and she's upset with me that I went against her psychiatrist, which I didn't even know she had. Had I known, he probably wouldn't have made poor guy, wouldn't have put him together. Me skin. So she's upset with me because I went against the psychiatrist. I didn't know they existed. And a psychiatrist know be- knows better. So why don't you ask the psychiatrist to make this evil? Why are you coming to me? So this is a business I don't want to be in. But if I have a match for you, I'll try. I just don't want to go into the business of doing it on a regular basis. It's just, it's, I have enough headaches in my life. One miracle at a time, guys. One miracle at a time. So Rabbi Akiva, we'll go back to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is telling us here. Rabbi Akiva is saying, the fact that you're a human being is already amazing. You're in the image of God is already amazing. It's a huge accomplishment. It shows that Hashem loves you. The fact that He told you, extraordinary. Why? Because if you were an atheist and you didn't know why you were here, you'd have mamash a purposeless life. There would be no purpose for you to be here. Someone that dies, if they're an atheist, no one should cry over him. Why? This is what he wanted. It's the same thing. He went back to the land. He became, I don't know, a tree. He became part of the wind. He became soil. It's the same thing. Nothing had, nothing, it was energy. He stayed energy. He didn't die. He stayed energy. You say he was energy before. He came from nothing. He went back to being nothing. Why are you crying? Why are you crying? He doesn't believe that God created him. He said nothing created him, so he went back to being nothing. What's the problem? He said the book is not real, right? So he's going to become a tree. We're going to print the book on him. Do him a favor. What's the problem? He has a purposeless life. Mama's purposeless life. There's no point to live. Anything he did, no one cares about. On the other hand, if someone is living for a God, he's saying, listen, this God told us that this life is just a corridor. It's just a station. It's just the first starting out job. I came here to pay my dues, work myself up the work ladder. You know, you start in the mail room. Eventually you want to be CEO, but you can't start a CEO. So here, this is the mail room. Little by little, you do tshuva, you start getting closer to Hashem, you feel like you got a better position. Little by little, you go up, 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 up. Eventually, before you go to the next world, you're supposed to be at your height, the best situation. So when someone dies, if they were righteous, the only crying that should be done is for us that are still here. That we're not going to live next to them because they're so righteous. We're missing out on their Torah. We're missing out on their wisdom. We're missing, we're missing out. But for them, we shouldn't cry. Why? They're in a much better place than all of us could ever imagine. So when someone is living for a God, when that God is, Israel, is the God of Israel, He's telling you this is just the first station. Eternity is the next one. What kind of eternity is up to you? So, the verse that uh, Rabbi Akiva uses as a proof for what he's saying is the verse that Hashem said to Noah. Hashem said in the Parashat Noah, when Hashem destroyed the world, after there were so many sinners, he says, listen, I don't want to destroy the world again. So I'm going to give you some rules to follow. I'm going to give you seven laws. That as long as the world follows these laws, you're going to be okay. Seven. If you don't follow these laws, there's no point for this world. The first six I gave to Adam Rishon. I'm giving you number seven. That's why it's called the seven Noahide laws. The first of these laws is this. The verse that he uses here is in Elohim uh, Adam, because in the image of God, he made man. But what does the actual verse say? The whole verse says. The whole verse is in chapter 9, verse 6. The law is, if a man who spills the blood of a person within a person, his own blood will be spilled because in the image of God, Hashem created man. So 
this is a very big tongue twister spill of blood within blood of blood I mean there's a lot of blood here shouldn't we just say if he killed somebody it's at the end if this law is the law for murder then it should be the same thing as the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments says, don't murder. But here, it doesn't say that. Here it says, someone who spills the blood of a man within a man, his own blood will be spilled. If it was purely murder, it should say, someone who spills blood, his own blood will be spilled. So, this verse actually is the source of why wasting seed is not allowed for anyone, Jews or Gentiles. Because this is exactly what it means. The blood of a man, we know, is just blood. But the blood of a man within a man is seed. The blood of a man, whoever spills the blood of a man within a man, his own blood will be spilled. So here we know that we're, it's not referring to murder. He's referring to someone that's wasting seed. Someone that's wasting seed according to God whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, it's considered 100% murder. Why is it considered murder? Because you're expected to live like a human being that is a, knows that he's in the image of God, not an animal that just procreates out of instinct. So this is exactly the verse that Rabbi Akiva chooses instead of any other verse. There's other verses in the Torah where Hashem says that he created us in his image. It's not the only one. He chooses this one. The reason why is, if you remember last week's uh, Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva, the, the first law that he said to keep you away from sin and stay connected to God, the first thing is, Stay away from mockery and, uh, and levity. Don't joke around too much. Don't be uh, overly uh, comfortable and flirtatious with people that you're not allowed to be with. Why? Because... It leads you to immorality. It leads you to promiscuity. It leads you to things that you're not allowed to do. So here, in this Mishnah, he's just continuing the same thought. He said, remember, why should you not be overly joking, overly immodest, overly uh, flirtatious? Because you were created in the image of God. And if you don't, if you create in the image of God, obviously, you want to protect that image. Because if you don't, remember, there's a verse after you in the Torah. That, that verse says, yes, you were created in His image. But before that verse is completed, it tells you, why were you created in His image? Because it's a reminder not to waste seed. It's a reminder not to make sex crimes. So here, this is a very, very deep first part of the Mishnah. And Rabbi Akiva says, the fact that Hashem told you this is an indication of love. Why? Because if you didn't know this, and you lived your whole life, 50, 60, 70, 80, 120 years, not knowing this, then you could be, in your eyes, the most righteous person in the world, but still have no share of the world to come. Because one of the the three worst sins in Judaism are, first one is Chilu Shabbat, Second one is Chilul Hashem, and third one is Zerah Levatala Mezid, wasting seed on purpose. So someone could lay tefillin, have a kosher wife, have a kosher husband, kids in yeshiva, give tzedakah every week, kosher business, everything's wonderful. Goes to synagogue, great. But once in a while, when his wife says she has a headache, he says, okay, I'm not going to wait for her. He can't control himself. That, my friend, he can lose his olam haba. As simple as that. A person can live his whole life living a lie, thinking it's the truth. So Rabbi Akiva says, the fact that Hashem gave you that text message to let you know you're created in His image, that's already in Parashat Bereshit. It's already the beginning of the Torah. You don't even need to be a Talmud Chacham, know the entire Gemara, the Shas, the, the whole Zohar, nothing. It's Bereshit. Just read the commentary, Bereshit, that's what it says. Just read it. So that's already an indication he loves you. I've heard enough. New arrival screams. 
echoing through the hallway to know that this ain't good. Once they pass them through the infierno, they don't come back. It's enough to make you go crazy. Do not think we fear you, spirit. We know your power is born of evil. This is your last night in the land of the living. You understand me, malevolent demon? that lived here called the Hetheringtons, and unfortunately, their daughter passed away of a heart attack inside the house. Basically, they were so devastated that they reached out to people claiming to be psychic mediums. They actually weren't psychic mediums. They opened up a total of 11 portals inside this house and invited spirits and entities from all different kinds of dimensions. Well, I think there are certain pieces of evidence that there is an afterlife. The resurrection of the dead is affirmed uh, pretty clearly uh, in the Talmud and the Midrash. To be honest with you, to give this lecture is a nightmare. If it was up to me, I wouldn't. There's going to be some graphic details. This place is a maze. The person after death went to a place called Sheol. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. People go to a place and they experience weird things. And sometimes they actually will see a character of some type. Well, where did that come from? I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. They may describe feeling profoundly peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light. Some people describe watching doctors and nurses working on them with incredible accuracy. Next thing I knew, I was above my body watching the operation. How long did you feel like you were gone? I went to a place of timelessness. And so what that means, it could have been a second, it could have been five minutes. I don't know. Can you imagine waking up from your sleep and not being able to move? As I'm lying there, I realize that there's a, an evil presence next to me. Do you believe that angels, demons exist? Holy oh, dude, get out of here! Oh my god, dude! Strange things keep happening. Bizarre nightmares, as if I'm on fire. <gasps> Whoa, what the hell is this? My mouth got bad, yes, man. Satan's Hollow is what it's called, the portal to hell. Some people calling it an eye of fire, while others said it looked like the portal to hell opening up. In the next 
thing I know, I was outside of my body looking at my body. What I'm going to do is called claromancy, the art of throwing lots or throwing bones. 2,000 years of experience passed down, recorded, of how demons work. God has them all on a leash, and he lets the leash go enough to let them tempt us because that's what makes us spiritually stronger. I'm trying to be as graphic as possible so you understand what we're talking about. It's your ticket to reality. It's your ticket to freedom. It's your ticket to immortality. Is there an afterlife? Is there a it's God? It's the type of information that can keep you away from the itself. What happens to us after we die?